Hey, this is Steve with Dabble Lab, and this is the second episode in a new series, uh, tutorial series that we're working on called Dabble with Experts. And basically what it is is we, um, we have an expert on that shares something awesome that is useful in building bots and digital assistants. And today uh, we are joined by Jonathan Burstein with um, Jargon, and he's the chief technology officer there. Hey, Jonathan, thanks so much for sharing your time with us today. Uh, before jumping into it, can you tell us a, a little bit about Jargon and what you're going to be teaching us? Absolutely, and thank you for having me, Steve. Uh, so Jargon, we're a relatively young company based in the Seattle area that uh, recently went through the Amazon Ex Alexa Accelerator this summer. Um, and during the Accelerator, we really learned a ton about the challenges that Alexa skill developers are facing. Uh, and we're building tools really to help solve those challenges. So our first product comes in two parts, and what I'll be describing for you today is the Jargon SDK. And at its core, the Jargon SDK is all about how you manage the content in a skill. And by content, we mean the text that you pass back to Alexa, the Alexa service, that then either gets spoken by the Alexa device or gets displayed to the user, be it on the device's screen if it has one or on the companion application. Okay, cool. So um, what, what, are, what are some really obvious uh, use cases? What, uh, like I know um, where you're trying to set up a skill that supports, for example, different languages. Absolutely, so I think you know, one of the driving factors for the Jargon SDK is multi-language support. And that it ties in with our other offerings. The, one of the first things that we've built to go along with the SDK is a content platform with an eye towards localization. So say, for example, that you have a skill that you've built in English, but you weren't thinking about what it would take to, say, release that in German or Spanish or one of the many and ever-increasing number of languages that Alexa supports. So today I'll show you the first part of using the Jargon SDK to manage the content in your skill. And a large part of that is taking all of that content and separating it out into a language-specific file. With that language specific file, as well as your store metadata and interaction model, you can upload those to the target content platform, and then we would take care of the localization for you. But the SDK is really clear to that, really key to that, because of the need to have that content separated from your skill source code and have a way for your a single source base to work worldwide. Okay, cool. So would it, would it be accurate to say that the, uh, the, the Jargon SDK makes it super simple to create a skill that supports multiple languages? It, it, it is by far one of the key pieces that you need. There are still, still a lot of challenges in having an international aware skill, really, depending because it, it depends on the content of your skill. Okay. With local information, dates, currencies, Anything along those lines, you know, that will still take work to customize it appropriately to ensure that your customers in each locale are really getting a skill that was built for them as a native customer. Okay, cool. Well, I'm uh, I'm I'm excited to see how it works. Let's uh, let's jump into the the coding part. <laughs> Great. Well, let me go and uh, share my editor, and we'll get started on that. Awesome. All right, so what I have here as a starting point is the standard Alexa Hello World skill template. And most of our time here is going to be spent uh, within the Lambda function um, because you know, that's really where the SDK comes into play. So to start off with, let me get the terminal open. So this was a skill that was created with the CLI, the Ask CLI? Exactly. Got it. So okay. you're doing ask new and basically choosing all of its default. Okay, options. okay, got it. Uh, so the first step is to actually go and get the npm package for Jargon installed. Uh, so let's get into the correct directory there. And if I typed everything correctly, which I think I did. That is gonna go and put onto there. So great, so now we've gotten the core package in place. Um, you know, it's, just, it's a standard NPM package, open source, and certainly we would welcome any sorts of contributions from folks, be it bug reports, suggestions, ways we can improve, um, and certainly any code contributions that people are willing to take on, more than appreciated. 
Uh, yeah, well, well, we'll definitely leave the, um, the, 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 the Git repo link in the, the show notes. Awesome. So the first step now, so now, you know, here we have the basic skill template. And just, you know, it's a standard ask v2 um, setup where we first pull in the Alexa SDK to find the different intent handlers. And so here we have our launch request, hello world, uh, help, you know, cancel and stop, so on and so forth. Just the, the really those core, hand, those core defaults, intents along with the hello world intent. And then finally, you know, we have the pieces where we have everything initialized. So let's go start off and bring jargon into the fold. So the first piece is to go and import a couple of different pieces from the jargon SDK. That's going to be the jargon skill builder and then a small helper function, which I'll describe in a moment as, it, as we get okay. to that. So the first step after importing the necessary pieces is to go and make use of the jargon skill builder. Now the jargon skill builder, while it has a number of options that you can pass to it for um, the bulk of use cases, we think the default options really will do everything that people need. So okay. don't need to dive into those options anywhere at this point, but certainly at some point they might become useful. And so here we go and you know, here we have the original creation of the skill builder. And now to make that the jargon version is really quite simple. We simply instantiate a new jargon skill builder and then we install it onto the standard one. And that's it. So at this point, what's happening under the covers is the jargon skill builder is going in and installing uh, requests and response interceptors through the standard skill builder. And those, and in particular, the request interceptor is where a lot of the core logic happens. So that request interceptor, when a request comes in, determines what locale the request is from goes and loads the appropriately content for that locale, and I'll go into a little bit more details on how that works in a bit. And then adds some additional objects onto the request object that gets passed to your intent. And those, that, the main object there is what we call the jargon response builder. The okay. jargon response builder mirrors the standard ask response builder, but makes it possible then to access the, the, the customized and localized resources. So we'll get to that in one second. Got it. So, so if you have a skill that is set up for different locales, um, and for uh, for for people who are familiar with building Alexa skills for different locales, that might uh, that would include uh, different models for each one of the locales and some updates to your skill.json. Assuming that stuff's all done, you're you're ready to go with your SDK. It sounds like correct. Correct. Yeah. So I'm not. I'm not. Gonna, I'm not really going to touch today the uh, modifications that you would need to make to your skill metadata file or constructing a new language or interaction model uh, for the new locale. Very important parts. Okay. Um, that, that's something perhaps better. Better when we're talking about Jargon's overall services. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Cool. All right. So now at this point, you know, we have the Jargon skill builder in place, and the next piece is to start you know, incrementally, intent by intent, of switching over to use the jargon response builder instead of the standard one. So the first thing that we need to do is to create our resource file where we're going to be moving the content into. Um, and so resource files live, first of all, in the resources subdirectory under your Lambda function. And then each file is named by the locale that it supports. Um, so in this case, we're in English, so we create our US English locale file. And then under, you know, it's a simple JSON file. Uh, so just go and create that. So within that file, first of all, we have a top level object that holds everything very standard. And then you, we have keys and content. Again, very basic JSON. So the keys are the identifiers that your source code uses to refer to a specific resource. Um, and then the content is what you actually want to render or display for that particular language. Now, within the resource format, there is a lot of different provisions for things like variables, um, you know, values that you fill in at runtime, as well as making sure that you have all the tools that are needed to construct grammatically and idiomatically correct uh, statements and sentences across different languages. And areas where this comes into play are things like pluralization 
And then for the languages where it matters, not really English very much, but a lot of other languages, um, for gender and formality in particular. Um, but again, that's, that's a little bit more of an advanced feature, which we won't necessarily get to right away. Um, so let's go back now and start working through intent by intent to move our content over into the jargon resource file format. So first of all, we'll start with our launch request. Um, so here we've got the speech text, what we're displaying to the, you know, what's going to be spoken to the user when they open up the skill without triggering something in particular. So we're gonna go and copy and, and paste this. Switch back to our resource file. We'll give it the name launch and then simply paste over our content. Now that's the first step. And then the next piece is to go and change it so we're loading this content from, from the resource file through the jargon SDK. And this is where this RI function that we imported before comes into play. So RI here means render item. And a render item is a reference into your resource file and contains two key pieces. The first and most important is the specific key. And so here we have the identifier launch that matches up with the identifier that we have in our JSON file. And that's the indication that we're looking to render this particular piece. The second piece, which we're not using right at this time, are parameters. And the parameters would be useful when you have variables. Uh, the variables are just a simple key value map um, or key value objects. And we'll hopefully have some examples a little bit further down where we can show how those are used. Okay. So now we have our, you know, we've stored our render item into the speech text variable. So the first thing that we do, instead of using the standard response builder, we switch over and use the jargon response builder. And we have, you know, we have made that available under a, two different ways, or a few different ways. The simplest, instead of you, is just under JRB for jargon response builder. Uh, for people who prefer a more, ver a more verbose, longer thing, you could also use jargon response builder spelled out um, in this fashion. Some okay, people prefer just, that for readability. Just want some, uh, some practice typing or something. <laughs> or, or who really, really, really do like to type. But yeah. um, I do way too much typing, and for the benefit <laughs> of Morris, I try to keep things short and sweet. So, so I have a question on the, um, the, the, the render item and the, uh, the resources. Are the resources always local to uh, the skill code or could they all be remote or in a, in a database or um, are, there, are there options other than just the, the local JSON file? That is an excellent question. At this point, we only support resources that are local to the Lambda code and integrated with the code base. Got it. But definitely on our roadmap, it's stuff that we're gonna be working on over the next few months and hopefully releasing by the end of the quarter uh, is the pro is provisions for having your content managed remotely uh, within the jargon content platform. Got it. So, so, our, so there might be sort of effectively a, um, you know, a, a voice content management system uh, at, at some point where you could pull this from a, uh, you know, a, a, a shareable data store someplace where people could go in and update it. Is that exactly the whole the whole rationale of having the content live on a backend system? Is it's it's really a few different core reasons, and and you know, the first one, the one that we're tackling first, is to make it a lot easier for everyone to update the content of the skill while this when the skill has already been deployed. You know, today using a static file requires the development team getting involved and going through the deployment process. Now, for yeah. a lambda function that deployment process is pretty simple. Mm -hmm. yeah. But it's still the time and effort you know, to go through the people who have the skills and the permissions to do so. Yeah. And you know, for a lot, of develop, a lot of companies in particular, you have your development team, but then you also have your content managers, mm -hmm. the marketers, people driving promotions, who would all love to just be able to modify the content for a skill through a simple web interface, and that's what we're working on. Got it. Yeah, I know that's um, uh, that, that, that's something that uh, comes up often when we're working on projects is, uh, you know, some some way to allow the, the, the client or the content managers to, um, you know, to, to access and collaborate on this stuff after the skill has been deployed. And, and this kind of thing uh, with Amazon, it wouldn't require resubmission for certification. So uh, that would be great, too. You can kind of make changes as you... Um, 
while the skill's live. Exactly. Yeah. This is all backend changes, so there's no um, recertification or resubmission necessary. Okay, cool. All right. Awesome. All right, so as we see here, we've gone and taken care of our speech and reprompts, you know, changing that so that they're using a render item. But we still have one more raw string that we need to change, and that's the card title here. So let's go and create a new resource to be able to move that over as well. And this is one that we're going to be using in a number of different of our intent handlers. So we're just going to use car title across the board. And I've got too many quotes there, but there we go. So we've got that set up. And so now here, I'm going to go and create a new render item. And while I'm storing it in a variable, of course, there's no need to do that. You could have just done the RIPs directly as a parameter. But and there we go. So now we've gone and taken our first intent and created it and moved it over to use the Jargon SDK. Um, now, the, one of the nice things about the Jargon SDK is that it works with the existing Alexa skill builder. So right now, even though I've only updated a single intent, the skill, is you know, the skill code is totally usable. You could deploy it and it would work just fine. You know, where you've used the, had the intent, use the Jargon SDK, it will do so. For your other, the other intents here that haven't been modified yet, those will continue to directly call against the standard response builder. And under the covers, the Jargon SDK is using the standard response builder functionality to construct the final response that gets sent back to Alexa. So we're really trying to minimize any form of duplication with what Amazon has already built. And we're also making sure that all of the native functionality of the, the skill kit is still available for a developer. So as Amazon updates the skill kit, adds new functionality, that's going to be available for you right away, even if the Jargon SDK hasn't necessarily added the corresponding methods for it. So always, always want to make sure that we're providing all the functionality for, for developers and not yeah, that's, getting in it. Yeah, that's nice. And, and so if, if uh, for developers that have skills out there too, you could incorporate the Jargon SDK without having a, a huge lift that might involve changing everything all at once. You could sort of add it where it makes sense and make the uh, the changes over time where uh, where you where you have time or where it's appropriate. Exactly. Cool. So, you know, with say you have a skill that has 30, 40, 50 different intents, thousands of pieces of content. Um, you know, that it will take some time to move it over to the SDK mm -hmm. um, just because of, of the size of the content and being able to do that incrementally. You know, allows developers to, while they work on moving on that content, to continue doing the other tasks they need to improve their skill. Got it. And of course, you know, if you ever think that your skill might be localized at any point in the future, when you're starting a new skill, it really makes a lot of sense to use something like the Jargon SDK from the start to make sure that your content is managed and separated locale from locale. That way, you know, by doing it from the start, when you are ready to take it into a new locale, everything is ready to go and it will be a much smoother and quicker process and it will allow you to more quickly to address the growing markets that Amazon is bringing forward. And I think I, I, I just dabbled with it a, a bit now, but um, I, I, I would think even for skills that aren't necessarily going to be localized, there seems to be a lot of bells and whistles in there uh, for, for doing things like um, random prompts and those those kinds of things that uh, are out of the box with the SDK that might save developers time, even in cases where they aren't going to localize, right? Definitely. Um, you know, while localization was sort of the initial driving piece that made us uh, want to build the SDK, and that was really for our own benefits to have all the content in an easy to digest, to digest format. When building that, we are really looking to solve a lot of other content management, content related problems. Um, and as you mentioned, a huge problem with skills is variety. How do you make sure that you're not always doing the same thing over and over again? And that's a really great segue right here of what, it's, what it means to add variety using the Jargon SDK. So here we have our launch, you know, our, our launch content. And right now, if you're to run the skill, every time you say open hello world, it's going to read this exact same sentence. And obviously for a hello world skill, it's probably not something that someone's going to open over and over again. But manage, imagine you have something that you do want your users using every day. 
And you want to really make sure that as your users come back, that you're changing what you say to them so it sounds more conversational unless you're wrong. And so here, let's go and change launch into something where we have varieties. And the first step is that we're simply creating sub keys under, oops, and I took that wrong, creating sub keys um, under our objects. So now launch, instead of just being, having a simple string value, its value is an object, where underneath it, it has more keys and values. And what happens in this case is that the jargon SDK, when it sees that the resource that you've provided it is an object with multiple values, will choose one of those randomly. Um, at this point, random, in the future, we'll have ways of being more intelligent of terms of which variation to select based on the user's history and a lot of other uh, cool functionality. So let's go and add a different way of saying hello. And these are just keys, not an array. Here. Correct, these are just keys. Um, and there's a couple of different reasons for that. Um, so first of all, it, allow, it makes it really easy if you have specific knowledge of, of which variation you want to choose in a use case that you can directly refer to this. So oh, say, for goodness. example, for whatever reason, I really wanted to use variation two in, in a particular uh, I see. Now I can directly name that particular piece um, and, and use, it, use it. I gotcha. I gotcha. And, and then the second reason for using actual keys instead of arrays, it allows you and makes it simpler to uh, go back. You can ask the SDK, hey, which variation did you choose for this key when, you, when it was rendered? And that way you can plug things into whatever sort of analytic system you might be using. Gotcha. And be able to you know, better understand which resources are working well, which ones for whatever reason aren't as, effect as effective and ensures that you, know, you have a consistent name for them. If you're uh, using an array, as you add a new content, suddenly identifiers change uh, and it just becomes trickier to manage. Gotcha. So with, with V1, V2 in this case, it's really more variation one, variation two. I was thinking in my head, initially when you were typing it that, you know, version one, this is what we used in version one, but it's, it's, that's incorrect. I, I get it right, now. Right. And so, so this, you know, this, um, when I first started doing examples with variation, I started using this V1, V2, but these can be named anything you want. Gotcha. Um, gotcha. So they can be given semantic labels if you want it. So instead you can have like original, um, yeah. you know, informal, all, all different. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. So those, those are, are yeah. Possibility and, um, that's really helpful in particular as you have a larger organization and people are trying to discuss how to approach different aspects of the skill and what's the right tone and style and length and all of those different aspects of really tuning things for the user that, that you know you can give things names and be able to discuss it in that way as opposed to number 37. And I like the um, that you what you mentioned earlier the idea of using it in analytics where maybe you were trying to, to figure out is a casual or a, a formal tone better at getting somebody to move on to the next step. And so you might name one casual and, and one formal and then mm -hmm. add into your analytics and, and go, oh, it looks like our, our casual tone is um, causing people to engage and move on to the next step more so than the, the formal tone as an example. Uh, yeah, okay, yeah, exactly. that's, that's really cool. Okay, great. All right, so here now we've got our first intent done. Um, so let's, let's move on to one to be a little bit more interesting. Um, now I'm not gonna go and go through and do sort of all the extra pieces that will come into play of actually adding it to the interaction model. But let's imagine that um, Hello World here actually had an additional slot that got the user's name. And we're gonna go now and make it, you know, show how variables work within the jargon SDK. So we need to go and create, first of all, our new render item. And this, here we're gonna name this one. Hello world. And, you know, while here I'm using capital letters for the keys, that's just because, again, it's sort of a convention I started with, um, you can, have whatever way of casing and naming things that you want as long as it's a valid casing identifier. Okay. And so here we're gonna you know, have a parameter called name and it's very simple to introduce parameters. You just simply wrap them in 
curly braces. And then, you know, on the corresponding side, you would go and pass in the value. I'm just going to hard code for now for simplicity. Um, and so now here, here we have, you know, here we have something that when it gets rendered, this variable, um, the, the variable map is going to get passed into our underlying resource engine. And so the, you know, the value of name will get replaced with Jonathan. So something, you know, very standard, present in a lot of different systems. Um, but this is just, you know, of course, our initial basic use case. But of course, one that's really super useful. Um, and one thing I want to point out is it's very important that parameters have names to them and aren't simply positional. Um, certainly, I've seen a lot of systems out there where you just have placeholders for string content and order becomes very important. And that the, the replacement, you know, so for example, some systems you might just have formatting directives like, you know, percent %s to indicate that it's a string. Mm -hmm and you'd be passing your parameters as an array. Mm -hmm. That works fine in a single language, but becomes really problematic uh, when you're looking to move your content to a different language where the word order changes. Mm -hmm. And so the order of your parameters might have to change in order to meet the needs of the language. If you're using positional parameters, that becomes really problematic because now you actually have to do extra work to sort of indicate what's going on. Using name parameters don't have that problem. And it also provides additional context, you know, for someone who's looking at the resource file, they understand what each parameter is. This was just parameter zero, parameter one, easy to get confused, get things crossed up. In, in, is there, are there any control constructs also? So this kind of reminds me of like handlebars or, or mustache or, or maybe like liquid. Uh, uh, are you also able to uh, do things maybe if, then kinds of things, and uh, is that an option now, and, and or it, is it on the roadmap? Not at this point. Right now, the resource file are just static resources, okay. and any sort of logic um, that you would want would still live in your source, source code. Gotcha. So, you're cho yeah. you know, if you're choosing different resources based on different factors, um, or if you're combining resources in different ways, that would be driven from the code. Gotcha. Now, you know, what, you know, where is there a place for having richer templates that have logic within them? Absolutely, and I think that really will come into play a lot more. Thinking about multimodal skills. So as you merge together spoken content and rich visual interfaces, especially using the new Alexa presentation language, constructs and functionality, there, there, there probably is a, a use of having um, a richer way of constructing views. Uh, you can imagine like as in a model view controller system where those those view templates can have some amount of logic within them. Yeah, yeah. Um, but exactly what's the right way to build that? You know, what are the different trade-offs? What functionality should be there? How do you expose the right amount of power, enough power and flexibility that allow people to do the, the, the cases that are important to them, but yeah. don't make it too cumbersome or uh, involve a uh, lots of, of errors and risk and just convoluted messes um, yeah. is, is an open question for us. So we're, we, we don't want to tackle that until we have a really good understanding of where it's going to add the most benefit and balances the trade-offs of making sure that we still have the capability for localizers to understand what's going on and change the content into different languages. And yeah. that the content can be managed on the fly and safely so that people can change things, but without putting the system at risk of introducing the bad change. Yeah, no, that, 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 that makes sense. Uh, too many different ways of doing the same thing can often lead to <laughs> too, too much to, to debug. And uh, yeah, that, that makes, uh, that makes sense. So this, so this is, um, this is, this is really great. It, it, what is the, if, if somebody wants to, to learn more now, I, I know you mentioned your um, the, the, the GitHub repo, and I, I would assume yeah, they can look through the documentations there. Do you also have uh, tutorials that you're publishing? I, you, you, uh, um, maybe some more coming on the, the, the Devil Lab channel I know we've talked about. Uh, how, does, how does somebody learn more and, and deep dive into this? Yeah, that's a great question. So we have a few different resources so far that we have available for people. Um, so first of all, you know, the, the SDK documentation um, 
which is really all just a very large VB file at the moment. Um, you know, hopefully describes accurately all the different functionality and how to use it. Um, in terms of using that functionality in practice, we have, we've taken a few different of uh, the Alexa sa skill samples and have ported them over to use Jargon. Um, and those are all available on GitHub as well. And so that's the Hello World uh, template as an easy starting point. Okay. And then we've also done the trivia template and the, the button color changer template. And each of those sort of show examples of different and more, exact, more advanced use of the Jargon SDK. Um, and so you can go and just look at those directly at GitHub and they're all off of the Jargon organization. And you can also uh, create a new skill using those templates via the Ask CLI. Okay, great. Great. And I, can, well, I can send you the instructions. Well, actually, the readme has some instructions on the bottom of how to go and use those templates. Um, and you know, there's definitely a lot more that we want to do as we have the time to get to it in terms of writing some uh, richer documentation that really focuses more on different use cases and how you solve different problems using the Jargon SDK. Well, this is really great. I, I know I'm, I'm looking forward to, uh, to dabbling with it more and diving into it uh, a, a bit more because I, I see all kinds of um, uh, use cases with the projects that, that we're working on. And like I mentioned earlier, e even in projects where um, it, it's not so much a localization, just as I was looking through the, you know, the SDK, I, uh, I saw like uh, a, a lot of little bells and, and whistles in there that um, would be time savers that interested me as I was looking through it. So this is, this is super helpful. Um, I really appreciate you, you taking the, uh, the, the time out to do this and, uh, you know, being the, the, the brave second person to, to give this format a shot. So I, I thank you for that. And for anybody, uh, for everybody that's watching, if you have any comments or questions, you can leave those in the comments and we will uh, do our very best to answer any questions that you have. And um, this, this, this format's a new format, so let us know if it's valuable and helpful. And uh, if you have any thoughts about how we can improve it, those would be uh, very much appreciated also. So with that, I will um, say goodbye and, and thank you. And, and again, Jonathan, uh, sincerely, thank you so much for your time. Great, thank you, Steve. It was a real pleasure to be able to introduce Jargon to your audience. And we look forward to producing some additional videos for you uh, that dive, in, dive deeper into some of the different features of the Jargon SDK and the kind of problems they can solve. Well, that's awesome. We're uh, very much looking forward to, to seeing those too. So we, we uh, appreciate you contributing those. Great, thank you. Thanks so much.